Welcome, everyone. Um, I am Bob Aksafa, and on behalf of myself, Greg Bunke, Rudy Buntik, Andrew Watt, and Walter Lin, um, I'd like to welcome you all uh, to our Bunke Clinic Virtual Visiting Professor Series. Um, it's been an exciting series, and we've had some fantastic speakers, and today is no exception. Um, I have the honor and the pleasure to, to introduce uh, not only a respected colleague, but actually one of my closest friends in the field, um, Dr. Amir Tahinia from Boston Children's. Um, so I've known Dr. Taginia since 2000, actually, since December of 2000, when we were interviewing um, for plastic surgery, and I'll go into a little bit of detail on that in just a second. Uh, but Dr. Taginia joins us from Boston Children's and, and Harvard Medical School. Um, I'm, I've just kind of summarized uh, kind of briefly his training real quick. He did medical school at, at Harvard uh, MIT, so he's been in Boston for a while now, and then did residency in plastic surgery at the Harvard Combined Plastic Surgery Program, and he stayed in Boston for his fellowship um, under Joe Upton and, and, and others at Boston Children's and Beth Israel, and he's been on staff there since 2008. And his practice, uh, he's, he's extremely well known for pediatric hand surgery and pediatric microsurgery in general. <clears throat> As I mentioned, um, I got to know um, Amir in December of um, 2000, and we, it was our first interview in plastic surgery. I'm going to have this video play in the background. Um, and we were at UCLA. And there were only, I think, 10 of us interviewing. Um, and so, you know, there weren't that many people. And we, we became very, very close friends. Um, and we kept seeing each other at all the different places around the country. He was obviously in um, Boston, and I was uh, in Palo Alto for my, for my med school. And after all the residency, all the, all the interviews were done, he ended up staying in Boston and Harvard. I stayed at Palo Alto at Stanford. Um, and we never would have guessed that we were both going to hand surgery six years later um, and that we would obviously stay in, uh, stay in touch um, and, uh, and follow each other's careers. The, um, <clears throat> I've had the, the pleasure of visiting Amir and my other um, close friends uh, at, uh, at, at Harvard three times over the last few years, actually. So uh, it's been a lot of fun to, to kind of have this collaboration, and Amir has also visited us um, uh, a, a couple of times in the last few years as, as well. And, and it's, a, it's a bond that's quite strong between our two programs. Um, and, and with that, I, I, um, I, I want to, again, say thank you so much, Amir, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today and to give us a talk on your experience um, with uh, pediatric microsurgery. So um, Amir, I'm gonna go ahead and give you control now. And let's see, there you go. Okay, uh, well, uh, can everyone see the, my screen? Yeah, we can see the screen, we can hear you perfectly, and I'll ask everyone to please turn your microphones off and your webcams off as well during the talk, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for this uh, very kind uh, introduction, uh, uh, and uh, I appreciate it. It was. Uh, it was unfortunate a set of events that happened with COVID because uh, we were actually supposed to come, a group of us, to visit you guys again um, and uh, in, in March. And unfortunately, that ended up not happening. And I was supposed to give this talk at that time. Uh, of course, I did prepare it yesterday, but um, that's a different story. So uh, I just want to go through some of these um, issues. Um, so, uh, talking about unique applications of microsurgery in children, um, and uh, again, thank you so much for that kind introduction. We've known uh, each other for many years, and it's been a, it's a pleasure to give this talk. Um, so, uh, let's see if I can control this. So, this is the first thing that most people think about uh, regarding pediatric surgery of any kind. Uh, and it is the first thing that I thought of too. And uh, looking back uh, 20 years, um, applying for residency with, uh, with Bobak, I never thought that I would actually be operating on kids. Uh, but here we are, a uh, fortuitous set of events that happened to take us here. Um, I want to give a brief introduction about children uh, and what it's like to operate on children to do microsurgery in kids. Uh, and then uh, really talk uh, about two main issues in pediatric microsurgery that we've had the opportunity to tackle over the last several years. Um, children thankfully have few comorbidities uh, and so they can be very um, uh, much easier to take care of uh, when you do microsurgery 
uh, for a reconstruction. Their vessels tend to be compliant and elastic, but they are small and unforgiving. And so uh, technical sort of execution uh, as well as planning becomes even more heightened when you uh, think about doing microsurgery in children. Uh, for taking care of sick kids who need big reconstructions, you need a big team, you need expertise. You don't just need microsurgeons, you need other surgical expertise, you need ICU care, and you need these uh, teams to uh, work uh, top notch in order to achieve uh, uh, optimal, uh, optimal results. You also need to treat them uh, differently postoperatively. They usually don't listen to what, they, what you say, um, and that tends to be the rule rather than the exception. So you have to uh, keep them down, you have to keep them immobilized, and you have to control the healing well. Uh, and you also have to think about the fourth dimension, primarily growth, uh, making sure not to injure growth plates if you're operating on the extremity, making sure that you have a plan for what to do in a year, in two years, in five years as the child continues to grow. So these are all important aspects of the care of microsurgery, uh, uh, the uh, provision of microsurgery in children. So uh, here's a preview of my talk. Uh, I'm, I'm really going to talk about two main issues that we've encountered and we've uh, sort of tried to perfect over the last uh, several years working with multidisciplinary teams um, and highlighting careful planning and execution of some of these cases. Um, my first, the first part of this talk is going to be talking about jejunal interposition, primarily in kids who uh, are having issues with their esophagus, mainly esophageal atresia, but also caustic lye ingestion. The second part of my talk, if I get to it, will be talking about vascular anomalies. Uh, and as I understand, this is a one-hour talk, so I'll stop just uh, uh, shy of one hour so we can open up for questions and if I don't end up finishing uh, everything then uh, then so be it. Um, uh, the supercharged jejunum for esophageal reconstruction in children is what we've been working on for almost the last uh, seven or eight years. Um, I want to uh, talk about what the options are for esophageal reconstruction in children and why do jejunal interposition, and then talk about our experience and our challenges uh, and how we've overcome some of these issues. So when you talk about jejunal uh, reconstruction of the esophagus uh, or any kind of esophageal reconstruction, in adults, this tends to be usually due to oncologic issues. Um, and so the segment of involved jejunum tends to be um, uh, short. In kids though, especially those who have esophageal atresia with or without tracheosophageal fistula, the, 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 the um, esophageal defect can be quite large. Uh, so it could be long gap esophageal uh, atresia, which requires a long segment of some kind of reconstruction. Um, and these can arise from either, the, 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 the defects in esophagus can either arise from esophageal atresia, which is the most common finding, uh, or from caustic lye ingestion, which is the second most common finding. Uh, we've actually never reconstructed a tumor case in a kid, uh, nor an iatrogenic uh, sort of injury type of case uh, in a kid. So most, uh, basically the great majority of our cases have been esophageal atresia, with a handful of caustic lye ingestion. Um, so uh, when, when we reconstruct uh, kids, we have to consider p uh, smaller sizes and structures, but also in these kids who have esophageal atresia, we have to consider syndromic issues. A fair number of these kids have situs inverses, have unusual vessels, uh, are prone to clotting, uh, have uh, unusual sort of malrotation issues with their gut. And so, you know, uh, it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the Forrest Gump thing, when, uh, until you really do a laparotomy and open things up and start exploring, you really don't know what you're facing. And the other thing is that a lot of these kids have had operations elsewhere. There's a lot of scarring. Uh, and uh, sometimes it can be very difficult to dissect things in the neck, in the chest, and in the abdomen. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to uh, be uh, dissecting a jejunum and finding stitches all over the place 
not knowing where the bowel was divided before and, and, and how to deal with it. So you kind of have to be nimble and work on your feet uh, and, and, and deal with situations as they come up. Usually though, you're still dealing with good substrate. Even though kids have had multiple different operations, you're not dealing with diabetes, you're not dealing with smoking, you're dealing with good vessels and generally good tissue. So this can be one advantage. In terms of reconstructive options for the esophagus, there's no clear consensus, especially in kids. For small gaps where the native esophagus is mostly maintained, you can either stretch the esophagus out through this Fokker process, uh, it's kind of like uh, an Elizarov technique for the esophagus, uh, or you can do a direct repair. For longer gaps, uh, you have to make compromises. You have to make decisions about what may be the best option. Gastric pull-up and colonic interposition are sort of the mainstays of treatment, and most pediatric centers use these two options, but they have their downsides. Uh, gastric pull-up uh, can cause significant acid-related issues, uh, and both gastric and colonic interposition can dilate over time as they don't have the, uh, the peristalsis ability that, uh, that a jejunum can provide. Jejunum obviously is, it could be a good option, but it's curved uh, it, and uh, it's more technically difficult to perform. Uh, as I mentioned, gastric pull up, technically easier, but uh, they can have positional emesis, dysmotility, and then this whole acid reflux causing metaplasia can be a long-term problem, especially when you do it in kids. And colonic interposition, again, technically easier, but they can develop good dysmotility and redundancy in the long term. And we've had to revise multiple gastric and colonic interpositions uh, for conduits that were just not functional and not working well. Um, was there a question? Um, uh, so, no, I think, I think somebody just had their mic on. I'll see who it is and try to turn it off. Uh, Go ahead. Paul, Paul, uh, no, no worries. Uh, so uh, jejunal interposition has come as a potential alternative to see whether this is going to provide a better option than the previously uh, mentioned uh, option. So, and when you think about the jejunum, the advantages that it provides is significant length. So if you have a long esophageal defect, you can replace it. Um, the caliber does approximate the esophagus and it does have intrinsic peristalsis, but it requires multiple GI anastomosis and the vascularity of the jejunum can be unreliable. So you require supercharging free tissue transfer, some kind of microsurgical reconstruction, and it can be technically demanding as a result. And because you need to bring in additional expertise, it can cause uh, other oper uh, other issues. And certainly in our hands, this is a big operation. Um, and uh, it's, it's difficult to do it without doing a big operation. So um, talk a little bit about our experience. Since 2013 at Boston Children's, um, we've done actually now almost 50 patients, uh, 44 patients in January when I looked at this data, and now we're almost up to 50 patients. Uh, and they've spanned the whole gamut. The younger kids having primary esophageal atresia and the older, uh, almost adults, uh, young adults having had previous reconstructions that failed um, because whether, whether they were gastric or colonic, where they became basically uh, uh, non-functional. And we've had now fairly long uh, follow-up, uh, um, almost seven years now. Uh, and even though the overall results appear to be encouraging, we still need to study these patients long-term and really make sure that this is the right thing to do. Um, this is uh, what we call maximally invasive. Actually, Joe Upton calls these operations sort of uh, the, 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 uh, the live autopsy because you literally have to go from the neck all the way down to the pubis with a big sternotomy, laparotomy. Uh, and sometimes we do these operations in two days. So in the first operation, typically the, uh, if there's a previous conduit uh, that's been placed, uh, gastric, colonic, or the esophagus that is sitting in the chest. They have to do a thoracotomy, remove all that conduit, which is a source of potential metaplasia in the future. And then the next day we replace it, uh, or two days thereafter, we replace it after the patient has been resuscitated. Um, we typically supercharge the jejunum. So we pedicle it distally, uh, so we divide it uh, at, uh, close to the ligament of trites, 
pedicling it distally, uh, keeping the blood supply from the inferior aspect of the genome intact, and supercharging it proximally in the area where we, uh, where we placed it in the chest uh, for reconstruction. And we used the uh, Lima or Rima plus or minus neck veins depending on our, uh, depending on our venous uh, outflow that is needed. So um, once the uh, esophageal atresia general surgeons expose the chest, expose the abdomen, the first thing we do is we prepare the mammary vessels. We generally uh, see which side provides the best venous conduit and best arterial conduit, and we just go for that. Typically, this tends to be the lima, uh, but sometimes we use the rima as well. Here you can see in a short video how we go about this from an intrathoracic perspective, exposing the lima and the rima, uh, exposing the lima in this case, uh, and um, following it out as far proximal and as far distal as we can keeping it in continuity, uh, as you can see here. Uh, and as you can see, everything is sort of wide open. We follow this out all the way as close to the is takeoff from the subclavian vessels as possible to give us the maximum degree of medial rotation. Uh, and there's usually one vessel way out here that we have to take to make sure that it reaches as far medial as possible for us to be able to do our microvascular work. The next step, is uh, that we prepare the jejunal uh, vessels and the flap. This is highly variable, and the books and the articles that you read just do not do it enough justice. Uh, and so it's like uh, you have to rediscover it every single time. So we do uh, a very extensive dissection, fully uh, dividing, uh, opening the entire mesentery, removing as much of the fat and the lymph nodes as we possibly can to define the, the vascular anatomy. Um, we transilluminate uh, extensively and we uh, dissect carefully, especially around the veins. The veins can be very uh, unusual and uh, uh, vary in terms of the, the paths that they take and uh, we've had several uh, cases where we've had a little bit of trouble, uh, thankfully very few cases with the, um, with the uh, uh, mesenteric veins, uh, especially as they drain into the SMV. And that can be uh, uh, quite scary um, because the veins are very thin walled and there's very little room for error. Um, and of course the mesenteric scarring and previous surgery can highly affect the mobility of the jejunum. Uh, and so almost always, uh, in the great majority of cases, we go with the second or third jejunal uh, artery. And the veins, like I said, are totally variable. And we just pick the most, uh, 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 the vein that's the, the most easy to, to, to use. Then what we do is we sort of unfurl the jejunum as much as possible, dividing uh, one of the vessels uh, as you can see here, uh, and then sort of splitting the mesentery all the way up to the marginal arcade, which we do everything in our power to maintain. Uh, these flaps are almost always, when supercharged, when pedicled, these flaps are almost always arterially dependent. So once you divide this, um, the, count, uh, the clock starts in terms of arterial compromise. Because you leave the marginal arcade intact, venous compromise tends to be less of an issue, although we've seen it in a handful of cases. So we sort of unfurl this, we, we leave this intact, we prepare the jejunal, the uh, rima, uh, lima or rima vessels, and then we divide these. Uh, and here, uh, I just want to show you a brief video showing how we prepare the jejunal vessels in the flap. As you can see here, we've uh, fully dissected out the mesentery here. Um, and so we can see these vessels coming out. This is a vein, these are two of the arteries, and we follow them all the way up to the uh, SMA uh, uh, to make sure, just underneath the pancreas, to make sure that uh, we're looking at the right vessels and we're choosing the correct vessels to, to take. Um, and, and then we loop them, and then we carefully assess them for lie and uh, where they're gonna go. Here, uh, we've divided, we've uh, identified one vessel that goes into our feeding, the, what will be the flap, 
and then we uh, divide the marginal arcade that, that's going proximal actually. This, if you follow this, it goes to the ligament of trites, and this is where we're going to divide our bowel, and eventually this is where it's going to get sutured onto the spit fistula, the esophageal remnant that's in the neck right over here. So this is where we're uh, de uh, deciding where we're going to divide the bowel and we transilluminate, uh, uh, harvest our vein, and then um, ultimately uh, do what I consider to be the most fun part of the operation, which I try to do myself all the time, which is to uh, divide the bowel with the GIA stapler. Um, and as we'd also mentioned that when we started doing these, the general surgeons were all hot to trot about harvesting the flap. And it became very apparent very early on that the plastic surgeons need to do the entire part of this operation, which is harvesting the flap, dissecting out the vessels, and, 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 and really, they just leave the room now. And we do, we do the entire thing from the uh, harvesting of the vessels in the chest to dividing, to figuring out which flap would be most appropriate. And they basically learned to trust us because uh, uh, you know, uh, it, we, we had some issues with the general surgeons trying to get involved. So um, this is another picture that shows how extensive the dissection can be, the, uh, really marking everything out very carefully to make sure we know exactly what we're going to take uh, and trying to figure out exactly how far it's going to stretch. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so once we've fully dissected out the jejunum, dissected out the vessels that we're gonna divide and keep the one, and dissect out the ones that we're gonna also keep. Um, we create a defect in the transverse mesocolon, and we're gonna end up feeding the jejunum through the mesocolon. So it'll be basically retrocolic and antigastric to keep it as anatomic as possible. We keep the, we pass the jejunum into the chest, keeping it pedicled from below. Then we secure it, um, to the uh, neck remnant of the esophagus, uh, and then we perform on micro. Here's an example of the micro that's been completed showing this is uh, cephalad, this is caudad, this is the jejunum that's been transposed from inferior to superior. We've sutured it into place as a temporary way of securing it to the end of the esophagus here, um, and this is where we've done the micro. Um, a few more details. Uh, before I go into the results. We've had to uh, 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 change the operation around a little bit for a certain subset of patients. Um, so in patients who have old conduits, so previous gastric or colonic reconstruction, there's a lot of scarring and this, the jejunum does not stretch very well. Uh, in these patients, because we have a previous conduit, gastric or colonic, we keep the pedicle to the, to the stomach or the colonic transposition. Uh, and we do a double supercharge of the jejunum because we almost always have to divide a second vessel in order to get the jejunum up. Uh, and so, uh, and I'll show you a picture of that. And then there are these uh, subset of, small subset of patients who have very long uh, gaps. Um, and uh, we, for these patients, we usually have to two-stage these patients, uh, do an ALT uh, and then do a jejunum. The ALT is used to reconstruct the pharyngeal and upper neck part of the esophagus. And then we do a jejunum to hook it up to the ALT because getting the jejunum to reach all the way up to the hypopharyngeal area is an extremely difficult task possible but we also introduce a lot of loops. Uh, as you can see in the previous image, uh, the jejunum can have a lot of loops here. Uh, and so this can be difficult to, uh, to get all the way up to the neck. And even then the loops cause problems, bullfrogging and other issues. So we've avoided taking the jejunum all the way to the hypopharynx. Here's an example of double supercharging. This is the previous colonic conduit in a patient who was just, it was just uh, very over redundant, uh, and the pedicle we kept, and then we did two microvascular anastomoses to get this jejunum all the way up, one in the chest and one uh, one in the upper chest, and one sort of in the lower chest, as you can see here. And here's an example of a two-stage pharyngeal level reconstruction. Uh, this kid had a lie ingestion and um, had scarring just 
uh, uh, below, just at the level of the larynx, really. Um, as you can see, the kid is trached uh, and, and doesn't talk. Uh, and so we had to do the reconstruction very high up. And so we do this in a two-stage fashion. We do a, a sort of a super thin ALT to start with, uh, shaping it into, uh, and I'm going to do a little plug here, a nice cannoli. And for those of you who haven't been to Boston, if you ever come here, you must go to Mike's Pastries, which is in the North End. Uh, they make fantastic cannolis. Um, and uh, then uh, we, uh, we plug it into the chest, I'm sorry, the neck, suture it into the uh, pharynx, and create basically a spit fistula here. Let that mature over six months and then come back and do the esophageal reconstruction, as you can see here, to the uh, ALT uh, distal end. Um, as you put this uh, ALT into the neck, the shape changes a little bit and uh, transforms into another food item that we see often here in Boston, which is a lobster tail. For any of you uh, are welcome to come to Boston and uh, have some, uh, I, I highly recommend you come in lobster season and have some good Maine lobster. Anyway, uh, moving forward, um, here are some of the results uh, from our patients. Uh, of the 44 patients that I had a chance to review in January of this year, the median age was about four years. As I mentioned, we do them as young as one and as old as 24. Etiology was six with caustic lye and 38. Uh, long gap esophageal atresia in those patients, and 75% of those had had a previous failed reconstruction. Operative length has been 12 hours uh, for the entire operation. We've been able to narrow down the plastic surgical part of the operation to about an average of three to four hours. Uh, and this is one of the operations which is great to be a plastic surgeon because we come in in the middle, we leave in the middle, and someone else closes. So you don't have to stay till the very, very end of the operation to close the skin and inside your flap. You just do it uh, and, 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 and you leave and the, and the GI surgeons finish up. Um, uh, people have asked about monitoring these flaps. We actually don't monitor them. Uh, by the time the, uh, the esophageal atresia surgeons are uh, finished, uh, uh, are about to close everything, it's been about three or four hours after we're done. So they do a spy test, they look at the perfusion of the uh, jejunum, and if it's okay, they end up closing up. Uh, and thankfully, we haven't had any major complications. We haven't had any mortalities, no flop losses, and no leaks. We have been plagued with strictures, uh, although the number of strictures that we've encountered have been relatively well controlled uh, and small as a result of uh, providing good vascularized tissue. Uh, and most of the patients that I reviewed have been able to meet their caloric needs by about three months post-op. Some of the younger kids have had issues because um, they just don't do food. They don't like the taste of food. And so it's been a challenge to, even though they're, uh, they're completely hooked up and they're in continuity, they have this oral aversion uh, to eating. And so we've been working with uh, doing therapy to uh, help those kids. Here's a perfect example of a patient that you can see where the um, esophagus stops relatively high in the neck. Uh, this is a pre and this is a post after the jejunum. And you can see this is the, the, uh, the native esophagus here going down to the jejunum where you can see the clear rugae uh, of the jejunum. Uh, 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 and you know there's no stricture, no, no problem, and no leak. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we've encountered in doing these cases. Um, the first challenge is determining the jejunal reach. It's a curved structure, and so as you release the mesentery, you can improve some of the curvature, but you can't completely get rid of it. In some of the, in some of the cases, the mesentery can be unyielding because there's scarring in the mesentery. Uh, and so it's been a challenge figuring out before we divide the vessels whether the jejunum is going to reach. We've developed little maneuvers that we do, and still today it's, uh, we find that sometimes it can be unpredictable, although we've gotten much, much better at it. What we do uh, is despite all the maneuvers that we make, and it's on almost always a kind of a judgment sort of experience call, 
Um, but the, the one thing that we've learned is that the greater the distance between the, the artery that we end up dividing and the artery that we end up keeping in terms of distal perfusion to the jejunum, the greater that distance between those two vessels, the better the predictability of the reach. And so if there's one thing that I would sort of convey is that that's the one lesson we've learned. But sometimes you just can't do it and you can't get it to reach and you have to divide another vessel and hope that the vessel that you did do the microvascular anastomosis for um, uh, will, will carry things. Very rare that we have to do that. In terms of age, uh, in the beginning, we had sort of like a 15 kilo limit in terms of the kids. Then we dro dropped it down to 10. And now we don't even have a limit. We find that the younger kids actually do better. Um, the uh, chest, in terms of the, the proportion of the, of the child, the chest actually ends up being shorter. And so the jejunum has a much better ability to reach. And the microvascular work hasn't been as much of a challenge as we initially expected. So we basically liberalize things. We won't do anyone un, uh, uh, younger than uh, nine months to a year of age, but we've done kids who have been a year to a year and a half, and we haven't had any significant problems. Um, the other challenge that we found is doing microsurgery in the mediastinum, especially in a kid. You're looking at very small vessels, and you're looking at movement on top of movement. You have this child with a rapid sort of 100 beats, 150 beats per minute heart, and then you have a respiratory rate in the 30 to 35 range. And then occasionally your anesthesiologist is not friendly with you and gives them cardiac ionotropes such as dopamine, uh, which actually makes your life much harder with the heart beating. Um, and we've also had challenges because in the beginning we were so worried about making sure that the, there was venous adequacy uh, we've, we've become less vigilant about this as we've discovered that these flaps tend to be more arterially dependent. And so plug, plugging a big jejunal vein to a small internal mammary vein has not caused us any problems. So here's a video just to give you an idea of what this respiratory rate and heart rate will do to you. And this is a completed microvascular anastomosis. And as you can see, these vessels are small. And trying to do microvascular surgery here with the respiratory rate and the heart rate in a, in a small child can be quite challenging. So uh, we've had to uh, troubleshoot this issue. And again, this gave us a lot of fear in the beginning. And this was us after our first or second case. Uh, and But we've discovered that the key is trying as much as possible to um, stabilize the micro. And Joe often helped us out. Uh, when we first started this, uh, Joe actually helped us with this. It's, it's a problem of the frame of reference. And so if you frame your, if, if you establish your microsurgical anastomosis with a frame of reference of the, the, the mediastinum sitting on top of the heart, uh, the precordium, uh, then, then you're screwed. It's very, very difficult to do teno nylon, nylon sutures for a small artery. Um, and so uh, what you want to do is reference it to an area that's stable. And in this case, it's the chest wall. The chest wall has been opened. You have a sternotomy. And the chest wall is not moving that rapidly. Uh, and so if you ground your micro to the chest wall, then you can encounter success. And you can do micro relatively more straightforward. And so what have we done? One option is to exteriorize the jejunum. So what you do is you put the jejunum on top of the chest instead of slipping it inside. And you do your micro literally on top of the sternum. You can see this is one edge of the sternum. This is a right hemisternum. And we do the micro on top of the sternum. And so the, the chest wall is stable. And you can do your micro on a stable surface. Unfortunately, this can't be afforded by all the cases that we do because you need significant redundancy in the jejunum to actually be able to place it on top of the chest. So what's another option? So in options where you can't place it on top of the chest, you can create a hammock. And we just take a simple Esmark bandage. We put it on top of the chest, sort of bridging across, make a little divot for the, for the, uh, for the vessels, and actually stabilize it on top of the, to, and again, establish a frame of reference to the sternum. And so a lot of those sort of rhythmic 
uh, uh, movements are stopped and you're able to uh, perform the micro in a more predictable fashion. And the last one is this assistant stabilizing the double posing clamp, um, which, which can be challenging holding this uh, uh, double posing clamp, but, um, and, and you can do a variety of different other things, sort of put a, a stable wire or something, but we find that this works better and gives us the most uh, flexibility. And I just want to play you a video uh, of a case that we just did uh, last week um, where um, the, uh, the micro you can see is much more stable when the assistant is holding the uh, double opposing clamp with, this, with the microvascular uh, uh, forcep. Uh, and then you can see also here, once everything is completed, as you put this back onto the chest, you can see that this thing starts to move very rapidly. And you can imagine that putting very precise nano nylons in this is going to be quite difficult. Some of the other lessons that we've learned here um, is that teamwork is super important. You have to be able to communicate well with the esophageal otrugia team. You need to have an ICU team who is good at taking care of sick patients because these patients can get quite sick and you know they have uh, they can uh, they have you know multiple operations over multiple days. Uh, you've also discovered that expertise is important with different team respecting the boundaries. So like I said, the general surgeons now let us just do all of the bowel work in terms of getting the flap, getting it mobilized, transferring it, doing the micro. And then once everything is all set, they come in and then they do the GI anastomoses, they do the closures, and they do any of the uh, uh, airway work uh, or uh, vessel work that they need to do in order to pexy the aorta or the, or the trachea in patients who have uh, uh, other issues. Um, we've also discovered humility. I mean, we're really pushing the envelope in some of these kids. Uh, sometimes we can't close the chest, and so they've been doing rib grafts to reconstruct the anterior chest wall to not put pressure on the, on the jejunum, and we've been doing pec flaps to cover these uh, mobilizing skin and having, uh, you know, some difficulties with some of these additional work that we need to do. And so pushing the envelope in some of these kids, big operations, uh, has been uh, humbling. Thankfully, children are extremely resilient, uh, and uh, we've been able to uh, thankfully do a lot of these cases without any significant, uh, significant problems. And here's some of the folks that I want to acknowledge for for this work. We've got 20 minutes, um, and uh, I want to sort of talk a little bit about some another unusual aspect of microsurgery in kids which is in the treatment of vascular anomalies. Um, most of this work uh, I've done, uh, uh, Joe Upton has helped with some of it, but I have sort of become the vascular anomalies person at Children's Hospital. Uh, and so uh, it's been gratifying to take care of some of these patients who have very, very difficult problems. Just as a sort of uh, introduction, um, uh, the uh, vascular anomalies come in multiple different flavors. There's sort of the tumors and the malformations, and then you have these other random things such as aneurysms, fistulas, and lymphatic disorders. And uh, they can span sort of minor little things to what Joe often calls benignant, uh, which is uh, lesions that grow but are not truly malignant, but they can ser ser seriously compromise someone's health or quality of life, all the way up to life-threatening sort of uh, vascular anomalies that have so much flow that waste uh, almost give you sort of a DIC picture, waste a lot of uh, coagulation profile uh, molecules and, and cause heart failure or other issues. Um, most of these are treated with interventional methods. Newer medical therapies are also emerging, especially recently uh, as more genes get discovered. However, surgical intervention does remain a key adjunct to treatment, especially with focal, uh, focal lesions. And how can we apply microsurgery to these? Um, microsurgical applications are obviously one of the major and, and, and common things is for soft tissue reconstruction, uh, where you have a big defect after you excise a uh, vascular lesion and you reconstruct it in this case, for example, with an ALT. 
Um, but this is not what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to talk about sort of a less visited aspect, something that you may not have encountered in your practices, which is primarily microvascular reconstruction. And this comes in generally two flavors, microvascular bypass and microvascularly assisted, microsurgically assisted resection of lesions. So I'm going to talk about bypass first. The idea of vascular reconstruction, kind of like a vascular surgeon would do at an adult institution, but we don't have vascular surgeons at Children's Hospital. We are it. Uh, and so um, this has sort of taken me to, a, to a, 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 an area where I think uh, a lot of non-pediatric microvascular surgeons may not, uh, may not go to. Uh, I'm going to talk about lymphatico venous bypass, and this is not the flavor of lymphatico venous bypass that you see in journal articles and in microsurgical meetings these days. This was a 14-year-old. This was one of the first cases we did. This was a 14-year-old male who presented with worsening shortness of breath, and you can see his heart silhouette is massive, and he's got a fair bit of pulmonary edema. And it turned out that this kid had a big pericardial effusion that was drained and it drained chyle. Um, and so the uh, interventional radiologist studied him. They injected some uh, dye into his groin nodes and followed his thoracic duct. And it appeared that his thoracic duct was a little bit patulous and redundant here. And then ultimately, as it came into the venous angle, you can see here's this clavicle. As it came into the venous angle, where the internal jugular and the super uh, and the subclavian meet, it tended to stop and instead reflux to a lot of uh, local lymphatics, as you can see here. This sort of like patchy, cloudy type of appearance is reflux. And so we surmised that this kid. Um, was having trouble with drainage of lymphatics because of some kind of mechanical blockade, blockade, blockade uh, at the venous angle. Um, and so we sort of started to invent an operation uh, and that we've applied now to a small subset of kids who come in with uh, what we call uh, 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 lymphatic drainage problems, CCLA. Uh, and so uh, uh, lymphatic anomalies, central conducting lymphatic anomalies. Uh, and the idea here is that you, uh, if they have a pathognomonic appearing uh, uh, sort of lymphatic study, like I showed here, lymphangiogram, then they go under this operation where we divide the thoracic duct indicated by TD here, and we uh, switch it, we bypass it into a, a local vein, either the external jugular or the cephalic. And here's a picture of this very patient uh, where the uh, external jugular was used. You can see a yellow loop around the thoracic duct, which out here is relatively small. I follow it to an area um, just underneath the internal jugular, which has been retracted, where I feel like the caliber is big enough and I do the bypass. Uh, by doing a microvascular anastomosis here. Um, for this kid, who was one of the first kids that we did, he experienced significant improvement over the following week. The drain was removed, he was discharged home on a low-fat diet, and he's now almost eight years post-op. He has no symptoms, um, and he gets routine yearly echoes that have been negative for accumulation of pericardial fluid. And this is a kid who came in in extremis, uh, not able to uh, uh, perfuse uh, and developing massive pulmonary edema. And so uh, it's been, it was a gratifying operation. And we started looking at other patients who come in with uh, spontaneous leaks, chyle leaks from into potential spaces associated either with a lymphatic mass or some kind of poor lymphatic flow in the central channels. Uh, we see a lot of these kinds of patients in our vascular anomalies clinic. Um, and unfortunately, there's very few options, even for palliative care. They're basically drained, they're put on a triotide, low-fat diet, embolization of the thoracic duct. Unfortunately, none of these provide actual true treatment that I can actually improve them uh, or cure them. Uh, and so we published a study uh, of 14 patients, and by now we've done about 20. And I say that uh, I can tell you that we're very, very selective and probably one out of five patients who we feel 
that um, may benefit from this actually end up going through the screening process to have this procedure done. Uh, and we've had about a 50% success rate. The original set of patients that we did, five of them developed complete resolution of symptoms, and two of them had partial resolution. And thankfully, we didn't make any, anyone worse. We didn't have any major complications. In the vein of bypass, I want to mention briefly some of the arterial bypass work that we've done with vascular anomalies in the next 15 minutes and then conclude. Here's an example of someone on whom we've done an arterial bypass. And there's just a handful of these patients that we've had the opportunity to uh, try to help. This is an eight-year-old female who came in with an arterial venous malformation, as you can see, fairly extensive of the right forearm. Uh, and in her initial um, angiogram, you can see a very large radial artery pointed at with the yellow, a big ulnar artery. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the ulnar artery being the main blood supply to the hand, as you can see here, whereas the radial and the inner osseous feed this massive arterial venous malformation in the forearm. And so the radiologist got a hold of this, and you can see that there's, oh, I should mention there are two aneurysms here in the ulnar artery. Uh, and these are relatively small and well controlled, it seemed, and we decided to watch these. And then the radiologist got a hold of this kid and uh, replaced many of the vessels in the mid forearm with a junkyard of uh, embolization coils and got the AVM actually in fairly relatively good control, but also sat on these aneurysms. And as you can see in this more later angiogram, there's a big aneurysm here. You can see it better here. And there's a massive aneurysm of the ulnar artery here. And, um, and as you can see, her brachial artery is not small, uh, almost the size of an aorta, uh, absolutely massive. And as you can see, a fair bit of the AVM has been treated, but the venous phase of this uh, angiogram is quite impressive. And so this is me after being faced with such a case when the radiologist came and told me that although she's doing well, these aneurysms are gonna start causing problems now that she's 14 and she's growing rapidly uh, in puberty and these aneurysms are starting to take off and they're becoming problematic. And what should we do about these? The ulnar artery is the only perfusion to her hand. And so uh, when you examine her, you can see that you can actually visualize this aneurysm, and if you put your finger on it, it's very pulsatile and scary appearing, and there's another aneurysm up here based on the angiogram that you can see. So there's very few options other than a vascular reconstruction here. The aneurysms are getting bigger. They're gonna put her at risk for rupture or um, sort of clotting, and the clot propagating down the only major vessel to her hand. And so after a full dissection, you can see that these aneurysms were quite large uh, and they do need to be removed. And so we basically did a full arterial bypass, removing this entire segment and replacing it with actually local vein graft. The reason we did a local vein graft and not a saphenous vein graft is because her veins in her forearm, as you saw in that venous phase, were used to very high flow uh, <clears throat> and so had hypertrophied. Uh, had become large and we actually did study the veins with ultrasound to make sure that we could get a vein that was of suitable caliber. I had the radiologist come mark out a suitable vein for us that we picked together the day before the operation so that we picked the right vein and we put uh, a nice juicy vein to, to use for reconstruction. And here it is. Uh, I did leave a little bit of redundancy here just so she can extend her wrist. Uh, and now she's uh, about two years out from this operation. Uh, in the beginning, we checked this uh, via ultrasound every six months, and now we're checking it um, uh, uh, every nine to 12 months to make sure that she doesn't develop any uh, additional aneurysms. And so far, she's doing well. There have been no problems at the anastomotic sites or for the vein itself. Here's another patient who came in with a problem. The mom is actually a cardiac surgery nurse at the Mass General, presented with her baby. When she picked up the baby one day, she noticed that there was something in her wrist. And uh, as you can see, she has a pulsatile mass and the ultrasound shows uh, an aneurysm. These are rare. I've had the opportunity to do only a handful of these patients 
uh, young patients all the way up to two to three years old who come in with spontaneous uh, brachial or radial artery aneurysms. No one ends up figuring out what the main cause of it uh, is, except this patient had uh, a real reason to have it, um, which uh, I'll tell you in a little bit. Uh, these can be challenging cases, obviously. Uh, thankfully, it was just one artery, not the, not the ulnar. But um, you know, you're worried about leaving this. Uh, the uh, lesion can uh, bleed or it can propagate clot uh, and it can cause problems in the future. So we've been relatively aggressive about um, A, working out the patient to make sure there's no other problems uh, and, and B, uh, resecting and reconstructing. Uh, and this case, you can see uh, this is the aneurysm. And you can see that uh, it actually, a part of it seems to extend out here. So I tend to be fairly aggressive going well beyond what I feel like is normal vessel on either side, like you would in a trauma case uh, and reconstructing it with a, uh, with a vein graft. Um, uh, this ended up being myofibromatosis, which is an unusual infantile diagnosis. Um, the systemic workup, including uh, uh, ultrasounds, chest x-rays, and blood work was negative, so there was no other vascular aneurysms. Uh, and she's now one and a half years post-op with uh, almost two years now with no recurrence. And I keep a very close eye on these patients. Um, and the reason for keeping a close eye on these patients, especially kids, is that there's been in the literature concern regarding longevity of vein grafts in kids. There's been reports of aneurysms, primarily in the aorta renal bypass literature. And the question is, is it the graft or is it the disease? Um, there's been, uh, there's two studies that I've summarized here in terms of saphenous vein grafts that have been used in kids. Um, uh, and um, a lot of the studies have found some kind of non-aneurysmal or aneurysmal dilation, mostly non-aneurysmal. Um, and, uh, but the clinical uh, sort of effect of this or, or significance of this is not clear. I can tell you that we've been doing arterial brachial artery reconstruction in kids who have humeral fractures and who, who lacerate their brachial artery for many years. And we follow these patients long term and we haven't found aneurysmal changes. We have found arterialization of the veins but we haven't found any aneurysmal changes. And I've followed my arterial reconstruction patients for years and haven't found any problems with them. So uh, this is obviously a story to be continued and long-term results are necessary. The last part of the talk uh, in the next two minutes, I'm gonna cover one more application of microsurgery. Uh, a lot of these vascular anomalies tend to circumferentially wrap around end arteries in the extremity. And so, uh, the natural inclination would be to sacrifice a vessel, but I've been reluctant to do so because of ischemia, growth, and cold intolerance. And so here's an example of what we do. This is a recurrent venous malformation in a two-year-old. And you can see that the nerve and the artery enter into this previously dissected venous malformation in this kid. Uh, and uh, this is where microsurgery can really come in handy. Uh, and you can really dissect out the vessel and the nerve through this, uh, uh, through this lesion and uh, get a good result, keeping the artery and the nerve completely intact and do essentially a subtotal resection of the venous malformation. Here's another focal palmar venous malformation. As you can see, this kid had a deep dominant arch. Here's the vessel going directly into this sort of conglomerate of veins the vena commentantes of the, uh, of the uh, digital, common digital artery has become a venous malformation. And again, take out the microscope and dissect this out very carefully under the microscope, um, making sure to preserve the bifurcation, which can be a tricky area to dissect and uh, preserve, um, do a subtotal resection of the mass and preserve the vascularity. And here's some other uh, 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 vessels that we've done this work on, including brachial, radial, uh, Etc. Um, so I want to. That's my. This is actually my last slide. I want to conclude and open it up for uh, anyone who has questions uh, about some of the work that we've done, what I've presented. And again, thank you for the opportunity to present. It's been uh, an honor. Wow. Thank you so much, Amir. That was a, a phenomenal, phenomenal talk. Um, I think for those who 
we, we almost hit a hundred viewers from around the world. So I think uh, wow. for, for those who, who um, have not previously heard uh, Dr. Tagenia speak, um, I think you can see why um, I was very excited to have him. Uh, I mean, this, um, your, your, your experience in, in, in this kind of stuff, especially the jejunal um, flaps for esophageal reconstruction is really incredible. It, it, is the number of, uh, you know, you, you have about 50 or so um, patients that, I mean, I'm not familiar with this field too much, but it, that must be one of the largest series in the country or the world, right? Yeah, that is one of the largest pediatric experiences. Uh, there is a surgeon who does it uh, in Michigan. I forget her name. She's a thoracic surgeon who works with plastic surgeons, but she does mainly and exclusively adults. Um, so the pedicle okay. reconstruction for kids, uh, we're the biggest center that does it. And I honestly don't know of many other centers who've done uh, uh, as many as we have. And we've been lucky because we work with a good team uh, and they've sort of really pushed the envelope and they came to us and they said, look, we've got this problem of digital reach and we've tried X, Y, and Z and it hasn't worked and can you help us out? And so we basically, you know, invented, uh, you know, went through the, op through the uh, process of inventing this operation in kids. Uh, and people had talked about kind of called jejunums and all this stuff. So we, I can't claim credit for that, but sort of working through some of the, the difficulties involved, in, especially in doing this for kids who've had multiple operations, we've had to sort of reinvent the, reinvent the wheel. So. Yeah, actually that you, you kind of answered one of the questions that um, our dear friend, Hari Venkatramani from Ganga Hospital, who's on right now, just sent to me um, asking, how do you, how does one get involved in these types of cases? Do you, go out there and kind of seek him out or did they come to you? So it sounds like this was a problem that the um, GI surgeons were having, the pediatric surgeons were having and that they needed a solution for and, and so they approached you, is that correct? That is correct. They, they developed um, a couple of years earlier, uh, before we started doing these, they had developed and really marketed an esophageal atresia center. Uh, and so, and then they, as they sort of built the center and developed methods for reconstructing these kids, um, they discovered that they, there was just a subset of patients that they couldn't treat primarily. Mm -hmm. And so they came to us. Now, this is something that can be applicable to in different hospitals, but you really need uh, sort of an esophageal reconstructive team, an ICU team, GI team, everyone needs to be sort of on board and sort of building that from scratch, I can see would cause challenges. Mm -hmm. um, now, have you ever used the jejunal flap for a, a, a urogenital reconstruction? I know um, NYU presented a case of that. There was a question in the comment section about whether or not you've used that in a pediatric reconstructive type procedure. So the NYU case I saw at the micro meeting was, uh, they, I believe they used the appendix uh, for reconstruction. We have not used vascularized jejunum uh, supercharged or free vascularized jejunum for urogenital reconstruction. It's certainly an option and there the solution is very uh, creative and interesting. Uh, our urologists tend to use skin grafts and local flaps for reconstruction. Uh, in longer segment reconstructive options, uh, that's certainly something to consider even for potentially transgender patients who have uh, have trouble. We haven't done it for your general reconstruction. Got it. Uh, there are a few questions about monitoring of the flap. Now, as I recall, you mentioned that you, you guys actually don't monitor it. You just do a spy at the end of the case. And if it's okay, you basically yeah. are happy with that. Is that correct? So, so most of the time when we pedicle it, when it gets transferred to the chest, you know, uh, and you know if it's going to be an arterial problem. In one case, we connected the artery, we let the clamps off, and it still looked not so good. And in that case, it tended to be venous insufficiency as well. Once we did the vein, it perked up fine. So typically we know once we, the jejunum is one of these things where it's not like skin, where sometimes it takes time for it to declare itself. You know instantly, it starts to swell, it just looks purple, you know, and, and once you restore blood flow, it goes through this characteristic hyperemia phase and you can tell that it's being perfused. At the end, we actually leave, and at the end of the case, the, the GI surgeons actually do the spy. They've been doing the spy, and they actually do a scope from above as well to look at the mucosa directly. And as long as it looks good, we're good. We've 
debated the idea of putting like a, a, a catheter or something like that. The vessels are so small and there's so much movement in the chest that we are really worried about causing problems with the vessels. The last thing I should mention is if you have dead jejunum sitting in a mediastinum, you're going to get sick very quickly. And we check uh, lactic uh, levels in these patients routinely post-op the first couple of days. Uh, and so uh, thankfully, we've been okay. Uh, and I, I would also venture to go as far as uh, and, and say that, you know, it's almost like a Ron Zucker situation. Ron Zucker does her is uh, vascularized uh, um, muscle transfers and doesn't monitor them. And I think by the time you discover a problem, and by the time you get back into the OR, open the sternum, I think you've kind of lost the flap. And the whole improvement of avoiding leaks and avoiding strictures and avoiding all these issues, I think almost becomes moot because the flap has taken such a huge hit that it's just not gonna be able to come back and, and reclaim. Yeah. Um, now, you mentioned obviously with the vessels being quite small, um, do you hand sew uh, these vessels, uh, particularly the veins, or do you ever use couplers? What is your thoughts on that? So we hand sew the artery and we were we used to hand sew the veins uh, and we actually used to take sort of neck veins and we used to pedicle them down and hand sew those then we started doing the ima veins uh, and hand sewing those and then finally we started doing couplers because it takes so little time there is a vein mismatch which actually helps with a coupler and usually we use a 1.5 millimeter coupler and it ends up being fine Got it. You okay. can see in some of the images that there's a significant vein size discrepancy, and the coupler actually helps with that. So yeah, now I, I have a, a a suspicion as to what the answer to this question will be, but there's a question posted about whether or not you feel that there is a role for robotics um, in this. Obviously, this is a maximally invasive operation, but as far as um, stabilizing and that kind of stuff, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, uh, it's it's certainly something to consider, uh, especially stabilizing the flap when, when you do the microsurgery, especially being able to do sort of small vessels with a robot. I think it's a great idea, and I think it's something that, um, that uh, certainly can be explored. The one issue that we ran into is, and we discussed this extensively, is putting the jejunum and, and sort of putting it through the chest uh, while the chest is closed and you don't have a sternotomy, I think opens up a huge can of worms. Uh, you just can't see what it really looks like, how it lies, how much redundancy there is, how much, you know, you can't feel how, how much more you can push it over and bring it up. Uh, and so I think I'm just a little, I think we're all been a little bit reluctant to, tr to try that. I know some other surgeons do that. Um, I think we've been reluctant and I think being able to see it there, being able to visualize it, make sure that it's perfused, make sure that it's not kinked, make sure that it has good lie, I think has been a huge advantage, uh, even though the astronomy can certainly be challenging uh, in some kids who've had previous cardiac work. Great, thank you for that. Um, as you know, one of our current fellows, uh, Dr. Danny Balkin, um, is coming to you next year for a pediatric fellowship. Yeah, we're and, excited to and, have and, and he, yeah, he's very excited as well, especially after this talk. Um, he does have a question, so I'm going to hand it over to you, Danny. Amir, what an extraordinary talk. Um, and I say that not just because you're going to be one of my attendings next year, but because it's truly <laughs> you know, out, outrageous. My, my question is about the esophageal uh, long gap reconstruction. My understanding from what I learned about esophageal atresia at UC was, was that that Fokker procedure places these really high tension traction sutures and just yanks and pulls until the thing stretches. Um, and uh, a lot of the complications come from sort of high tension uh, stretching and, and, and such. Um, if, but if the Fokker procedure is successful, um, do you, is that still an inferior um, um, technique? In other words, for motility, um, you know, does, does the jejunum maintain better mo motility? Um, in the long term and, and it's, you know, neurovascular status? So that's a great question. So for those who don't know, the Fokker procedure was invented by a surgeon by the name of Fokker. I believe he's from the Midwest. Uh, the way we were doing it in our hospital, not we as plastic surgeons, but the general surgeons were doing it, they would um, 
they would use it for long gap esophageal uh, defects. They would come in, put these pledget sutures into the esophagus on either side, keep these kids in the ICU, intubated, sedated, paralyzed <laughs> for six months, uh, oh, wow. and bring them back every few weeks to sort of pull on these stitches and then secure them, pull on these stitches and then secure them, pull on these stitches and then secure them. And part of the reason they called us, you can imagine that, you know, that that could cause problems. You know, how good is that esophagus that's being replaced? How many problems are you going to have when you stretch it so much? And that's part of the reason they called us because they realized that they were having so many issues with leaks and strictures and stuff with these kids who had been um, vulgarized um, that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, that it, it, t it tended to work better for the smaller gaps where they could stretch the kids out and they didn't have to keep them intubated, sedated, and paralyzed for months. Um, and so that's part of the reason they called us. And, um, and now they're, as far as I know, they basically abandoned, abandoned it for long gaps. They continue to do it for short gaps, but they've abandoned it for long gaps, so. Danny, you had a follow-up question, I think. Yeah, and I, got, I have one last question. For your cent central lymphatic obstructions, um, my question relates to a patient that, that I had the opportunity to care for as a resident, and the patient had a abdominal level uh, uh, central lymphatic obstruction. And I was wondering if you've uh, done any microsurgical bypasses of things that exist you know, distal, um, you know, not in the chest, but in the, in the abdomen. Yes, I've done a few of those and I have not seen success. I think, you know, this is a very wide, uh, uh, varied um, type of problem. And I don't think as a medical uh, sort of uh, institution, as sort of like medical doctors and, uh, you know, our, our generally our, our uh, knowledge of this particular condition, lymphatic problems that result in chyle leak, that result in lymphatic leak, I think is quite limited. And I don't think we fully understand a lot of these problems that we see. Um, the ones that I've done have not worked. Um, I, find, I think part of the reason is you really need that intrathoracic negative pressure to get lymph to come up. And so, so if you're doing anything below the diaphragm, I think the likelihood of success, I think ends up being uh, frankly lower. Um, I haven't done a lot of lymph node transfers. I haven't done a lot of lymphatic venous work in the extremities uh, for lymphedema. My primary microvascular work has been for these kinds of patients um, uh, whose quality of life uh, has been significantly uh, impacted by this, by this issue. But lower abdominal work, sort of doing work in the abdomen, I've done a few cases and I just haven't seen any significant improvement. Uh, great. Thanks for the questions, Danny. <clears throat> I think we'll end with a more of a philosophical question from from one of our friends um, online. You know, I think this this is a question that I think we can ask uh, most of our presenters because they're doing really incredible work. Uh, many of which are things that they never did in training, so they're doing new things that that, that um, could be a little challenging and stressful. The question is, um, do you ever get scared? How do you deal with the fear of uh, embarking on a on a such a big operation and many times something that you may not have done before um, and in doing so how do you counsel the parents and how do you deal with them in such a big major procedure that's a wow um, that is a great question uh, and uh, the number of times that my heart has skipped a few beats the number of times that I've had to take uh, a, a, a metoprolol or as one of our older uh, uh, surgeons used to say, I had to change my depends. Um, <laughs> if I had a penny for each time, I would be a rich man. Um, seriously, uh, that, that's a great question. I think, you know, there is a very fine line between being a, a cowboy and completely fearless uh, and being open to exploring new options and doing procedures that people haven't done or really haven't done that much of. 
And I think uh, it takes a very fine balance of, I mean, we ultimately want to take good care of all of our patients. And so you don't want to put the patient at, at risk. And so some of the more fertile ground for development tends to be these patients who have these what appear to be very difficult, almost unsolvable problems, uh, like some of the patients that I showed you. Uh, these sort of, uh, you know, oral cripples. Uh, one of these patients that we treated had such a bad, um, I'm going to stop sharing my webcam, um, such a bad problem and such a bad lie ingestion problem that he had to carry around a spit cup um, to spit constantly. And every once in a while, he would sort of fall over and he would get spit all over the place, like in a restaurant or in school or whatever, or over somebody else. And so it's just an incredibly difficult, extremely embarrassing problem. And so when you're faced with a problem where there's really no other options, I think those are the cases where you can start to think out of the box and start to have a genuine conversation with the patient. And the patient understands that this operation that you're proposing may be a Hail Mary, but it's really very, there are very few other operations. And so if you take, you can take comfort in the fact that there's really very few other options to potentially explore. And so the, the, the thing that you're proposing is, is reasonable, it's grounded in reason, you've thought about it carefully, and you can take it on, and the patient understands the risk. And the last thing that I should say that helps tremendously is really having a partner uh, in crime, like, you know, Brian Labo, Joe Upton, Oren Ganor have helped tremendously. And, you know, having these individuals to help brainstorm and help you get through those difficult times where you've, you know, you've got this bleeding vein coming off the SMV and the blood is just pooling everywhere. It's really, really helpful to have someone to help you. So um, I think that would be the, the two things that I would, that I would say. Those are uh, really, really good points. And I think, um, you know, one thing that I would, I would add is, you know, one of my attendings in, in residency always said, you know, it doesn't matter how good you are, you always need a healthy level of fear. Um, and a, a healthy level of fear will keep you out of trouble because then you're no longer cavalier or, as you put it, a, a cowboy, uh, because you always know that something could happen and you know where the alligators are, so to speak. Um, and I just want to end with a comment before uh, we say goodbye to everyone. I think um, what um, uh, Dr. Tagenia's talk today um, has shown um, is that, you know, I really believe that what we do, um, we're truly surgeons, surgeons. And so our skill set is such that we can assist and help other surgeons trying to improve their outcomes. And I think it's all about developing the skill set and the expertise to be able to apply that to any problem that may arise, be it you know, esophageal atresia or lymphatic problems or, or AVMs. Um, what Amir showed today was basically the pediatric surgeons approaching him and his team um, with problems that they were having for a solution. He had interventional radiologists approach him and his team uh, for problems that they were having with AVMs and so on. So I think the, uh, to, to Hari's point earlier, I think the, the important thing is to, to make sure that we communicate with all of our colleagues at our hospitals so they're, that they're aware that these potential solutions exist. Um, and, and only that way can we actually expand our, our reach and start doing uh, do more of these really groundbreaking um, operations. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Great. Thanks, Amir, for, for joining us. Uh, it's really been an incredible talk. Um, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you in person soon. I'm not quite sure if it'll happen this year. Hopefully. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but hopefully in January, if our meeting happens, I do have you um, uh, on the speaker's uh, panel. So you'll hear okay, from us okay. shortly about that. And then okay, for, those of us who, for those who are still here, um, our series continues tomorrow at 7 a.m. Pacific time. We have Dr. Nick Haddock from UT Southwestern discussing optimizing deep flaps and secondary Option, operations, secondary options, excuse me, for, for breast reconstruction, such as a lumbar artery perforator flap. And at 4 p.m. Pacific time, we have Dr. Mingwei Cheng from Changgung discussing the latest advances in lymphedema surgery at Changgung Memorial Hospital. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Amir, and uh, have you. a great day. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right.